All right, let's talk about deep back muscles. In this tutorial, we'll identify the following muscles, including names, innervations, and actions. We'll talk about the splenius muscles, the erector spinae muscles, the transversal spinalis muscles, and a wee bit about those small suboccipital muscles. Uh, before we begin, a little note. Um, there's a lot of detail associated with these deep back muscles, but a focus is going to be on the following the muscle group, individual muscles, and their innervations and actions. Not so much the attachments, though I'll talk about the attachments as I go through this discussion. So first question, what is the difference between superficial and deep back muscles? So let's take a cross section right through the uh, trunk, through the scapular region, and this is what it looks like. And in yellow are the bones. So there's the head of the humerus and cross sections, and there's your scapula or shoulder blade and cross section. There's the thoracic vertebra articulating with the rib, and as the ribs course around the body, they go at an angle. So in cross section, you just see segments of ribs. Um, now there in red are muscles of the back, and some are superficial and some are deep. Now the superficial muscles shown there in pink, they're really upper limb muscles derived from hypaxial uh, the hypaxial portion of the myotome that migrate to the back and they're there to support the upper limb. And so superficial back muscles are really upper limb muscles. They just move to the back and they support and move the upper limb. And because they're hypaxial, they're innervated by the ventral rami. Then deeper are the true back muscles. These are the muscles derived from the epimere portion of the myotome and they're true back, mu uh, back muscles because they actually support and move the vertebral column that's their primary purpose and they're innervated by dorsal rami so our focus is going to be on the deep back muscles now the deep back muscles are also known as intrinsic back muscles because this word intrinsic has basically the same meaning as deep and so the word intrinsic in latin means interior or the inner or within doesn't that sound kind of like deep? Deep back muscles are also known as paraspinal muscles because this prefix para in Greek means beside. And so there's the spine, and beside the spine are these deep back muscles, and hence the name paraspinal beside the spine. And they're also known as the apaxial muscles because if we look at a cross section through an embryo and then there is the uh, epimere and the epimere part of the myotome becomes the apaxial muscles. And so there, all those muscles mean the same thing. We'll just be calling them deep back muscles. Most physicians call them paraspinal muscles. Okay. And there is our deep back muscles. And again, we're going to be covering the splenius muscles as a group erector spinae muscles as a group, transversal spinalis muscles as a group, and a wee bit about suboccipitals. All right, so let's start with the splenius muscles. It means bandage-like, splenius for bandage. It looks like a bandage going around the head, and then you see it coming around the back. Though it doesn't attach to the front of the head, the back part looks like a bandage. And there's two of these. One, the splenius capitis, because it attaches to the head. The origin is down on the spinous processes on the lower cervical and upper thoracic vertebrae. And then it's going to insert on the mastoid process of the temporal bone and a little bit about uh, the adjacent occipital bone. Then there's the splenius cervicis, and cervicis means neck. And so the, this muscle attaches to the spinous processes of the upper thoracic, and it inserts on the transverse processes of the upper cervical vertebrae. Now, collectively, the splenius capitis and splenius cervicis muscles have the following action. When uh, contracting bilaterally, they both contract at the same time, they result in head and neck extension by pulling the head back and this pivot motion as if looking up to the sky. When acting unilaterally, the contraction results in rotation of the head to the ipsilateral or same side as the muscle contraction. That's synergistic to the SCM. Now, the next group is the erector spinae muscles, iliocostalis longissimus and spinalis muscles. And so we'll start with the iliocostalis that arises down below by the ilium and a bit by the sacrum, and then it asc ascends to attach to segmentally attaching all along the ribs up the trunk. And hence the name ilio for attachments to the ilium and costalis, which is attachment to ribs. Whenever you see this word costal, think ribs. Uh, the next is the longissimus muscle. It attaches to the vertebrae all along the lower back, part of the ribs, and all the way up 
finally ending in the mastoid process of the temporal bone. And out of the, all the erector spinae muscles, this one is the longest, hence the name longissimus, because it goes from the lumbar vertebrae all the way to the skull. And then finally, of the erector spinae is the spinalis muscles, and this uh, muscle group attaches all along the spinous processes of the back. And so here we have our three erector spinae muscles, I, L, S, for iliocostalis, longissimus, and spinalis. I remember this for I love sarsaparilla, or some other word that begins with S. Okay, so there we've got now the erector spinae muscles, and what are the actions of the erector spinae muscles? And so we'll superimpose this onto this picture, and those blue lines represent the erector spinae muscles as a group. And so when these muscles, muscle group, contract bilaterally, what is the action? Well, the, one of the main purposes is simply posture. It just keeps your spine erect, hence the name erector. Where have we heard that word before? Like a penile erection goes straight up and straight up and down. The erector spinae keep your spine up and down. Um, posture. Another one is vertebral extension. When the muscles contract, they pull the spine up from this position to this position, hence extension, or to even hyperextension like that. And then finally, when the muscles contract unilaterally, it'll pull the spine to one side in this fashion lateral vertebral flexion. So the actions of the erector spinae are posture, vertebral extension, and lateral vertebral flexion. And there are the actions of the erector spinae muscles. And there are the actions of the erector spinae muscles. All right, so now let's take an outline and take a scalpel and cut mm, those erector spinae muscles out. And what we have are the deeper transversal spinalis muscles. Now these muscles, semispinalis rotatoris and multifidus, as a group get their name because they arise from the transverse process into a superadjacent spinous process attachment, hence the name transverso spinalis muscles. So we'll start with the semispinalis. It arises from a transverse process and then spans four to six vertebrae to attach a superadjacent spinous process. However, these upper fibers, as they course, will end up going all the way up to the skull and specifically the occipital bone. And so this is why it's called semi, because it's sort of semi, it's uh, semi-spinalis. It's partially on the spine and partially on the skull, like semi-sweet chocolate. Semi-sweet, semi-tastes like poo. Semi-spinalis, semi on the spine, partially on the skull. Um, spine, skull. All right, so now we've got our rotatories muscles, and those muscles arise from the transverse process and span one to two vertebrae to attach to a superadjacent spinous process. They're primarily located in the thoracic region. And then the multifidus muscle has multiple attachments. It's going to arise from the sacrum and transverse processes and, and course two to four vertebral lengths to a superadjacent spinous process. They're more primarily located in the lower back. All right, so there we've got our transversal spinalis muscle group. And what are the actions of these muscles? Now, a lot of textbooks talk about that they have rotation and so forth and some vertebral extension. I'm sure they have some of that, but clinically you're not going to see a whole lot from them. Their primary action is dealing with maintaining posture, working alongside the erector spinae, and they also have some proprioception fibers as well and contraction to know where your vertebral column is in space. All right, so now the deep back muscles, let's take a look at suboccipital muscles. So let's zoom in on this and outline that semispinalis muscle and then take a scalpel and cut it away. And there we've got our suboccipital muscles. And there we've got whole four of them. They've got really long names for the smallest muscles. It seems to be that way in anatomy. Really big muscles, small names. Tiny muscles, really long names. Rectus capitis posterior minor, rectus capitis posterior major, obliquus capitis inferior, obliquus capitis superior. I don't care if you know the names of all of those. But the main reason I want to show this is now let's take a magnifying glass and zoom in a little bit more on these muscles. Is that within these muscles, there is a triangle. We anatomists love our shapes like triangles. We call it the suboccipital triangle. And we like this because the vertebral artery that arises from the subclavian courses up in those transverse foramina of the cervical vertebrae, hits C1, and then it courses horizontally through the, sh through the base or the floor 
of the suboccipital triangle and then up through the frame and magnum into the skull and it provides the posterior blood supply to the brain. So just for that one reason I wanted to show that where that vertebral artery is I wanted to show this. All right, now the innervation of all these splenius, erector spinae, transversal spinalis, and suboccipital muscles is through segmental innervation at every neurological level from cervical down to sacral for those muscles are the dorsal rami. And I put dorsal ramus as singular, rami is plural. Because when we see this dorsal ramus, every single level, it sends a branch into these deep back muscles. So from C1, C2, C3, C4, dorsal rami, T1, T2, T3, T4, L1, L2, L3, S1, S2, S3, each of those dorsal rami segmentally innervate these deep back muscles. Okay, so deep back muscles in a nutshell. All right, so here we've got those deep back muscles. And so we have our splenius muscles, and we also have the erector spinae muscles, and we also have the transversal spinalis muscles. These are all our deep back muscles. And the actions of these deep back muscles is posture, keep your vertebral column erect, but also extension of the vertebral column, vertebral extension. And the nerves responsible for innervating these muscles to cause those actions is via dorsal rami, segmentally, uh, segmental innervation of dorsal rami at every level. There, my friends, are the deep back muscles in a nutshell. Thank you.